Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining me in the locker room today. I'm Alan Locker, and as you know, I grew up watching both As the World Turns and Guiding Light. I joined the PR department at both shows in 1997 and remained working there for 13 years before the shows went off the air. As I was stuck home here in quarantine, I realized that I was missing my Oakdale family and the shows that I grew up watching and thought some of you might be feeling the same way too. Today, we have our first show with some of the writers from As the World Turns, daytime Emmy award-winning writers who all have spent time in Oakdale, Landview, Salem, Port Charles, Genoa City, Bay City. I don't know if I've missed any along the way there. Actually, Springfield, I know, not as writers, but I think uh, as a director and a production assistant. So please welcome to the locker room daytime Emmy winners, Tom Cassiello, Susan Dansby, Charlotte Gibson, and Jean Passanante. Tom, Jean, Susan, and Charlotte. Hello. Hi. Did I get that all right? <laughs> you got Pine well, Valley. Pine Valley. Oh, Pine Valley. I didn't <laughs> have to think about that. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I know I, I do have, uh, you know, a question as we go along for, for Jean, especially, you know, um, I know you definitely work under Agnes, so I'd love to get to that. But let's, sure. let's so start in Oakdale since we promoted, um, and Charlotte, you did too under Agnes? Yeah. Yes. I mean, that, that's, that's, as, uh, that's royalty right there. <laughs> that's okay. daytime royalty. I should so, have a script that she edited of mine one time when oh, she was wow. an editor. Yeah, oh, that's great. Her notes in them? Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. That's, uh, I'm sure the fans would die to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so speaking of Oakdale, uh, since you all spent time there, um, who helped each of you learn the canvas of Oakdale when you got there? Or, or, or were you familiar with World Turns when you arrived? Well, I think all, all the three of you guys were all there when I arrived, I believe. No, no, yeah. no. no, I thought no, you, you were, were there. Anyway, no, Susan and Tom were, but um, yeah, but my, I knew the show from the, the fact that my grandmother watched it um, and actually both of my grandmothers who were from, who were immigrants from different parts of the world learned English watching as the world turned. So that was, my, it, it had- My a, mother and grandmother too. Yeah, that was that was its claim to fame. And so I watched it a little bit and I, you know, when I was young. Um, so, but I, I wouldn't say, I sort of knew Lisa and and the Hugheses and that was about it, you know, but mm -hmm. the, these guys, uh, apparently not Charlotte, but the other two <laughs> <laughs> were, were mentors in learning the canvas. Yeah, Susan was there the longest, I think. Susan, you were- Yeah. You were I lucked out because I directed the, if it wasn't the first Carly Jack kiss, it wow. was the most pivotal <laughs> first of the Carly and Jack kisses. Wow. And, and that really meant a lot to me. Those guys were so great to work with as a director and then to go on to be able to write for them. That's why I always had such a special kinship for them. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was that was about, gosh, I guess a year and a half before I started writing for the show, and then I wrote for thirteen years. So that was probably in '97, because I mean, Michael started, I think, in '97. So. Yeah, yeah, wow. yeah. And Susan, you wrote to the end, right? You, you I wrote were there. to the end. Yeah, you and I were there. So. <laughs> The last year. <laughs> I know every, we, we all, our memories are spotty, but it, we'll, together we'll all put it together. So Tom, <laughs> Tom, who helped you learn it? Now I know, I was fascinated that you grew up knowing you wanted to write for soaps. Oh Is yeah, that correct? my goal in life. I knew that when I was like 10. That's amazing. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was- To uh, have that dream uh, come true. Yeah. Um, it was what I wanted to do with my life. So it was, uh, yeah, uh, World Turns was kind of a crash course for me because I had just finished my internship up at uh, Another World when it went off the air and I was planning on going back to school. And then uh, Leah Lehman, who was the uh, head writer, uh, called me up over the summer and said, hey, do you want a job? And I, you know, had to make some very fast decisions about dropping out of college and I finished. <laughs> and, like, and basically my like, counselor at school said, you got to drop out. Like you have to take this job. Um, so I did. And it was kind of, like a whirlwind. I just had to like, get thrown into it. And I had to learn it real fast. So, 
Well, is there a Bible? Like what? I, I'm sure. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I know we have, you know, there's a world <laughs> turn. Jared was uh, the other writer's assistant, and Jared knows. Oh, everything. God, I have that. Oh, Jared. Jared. I let you know I still have that, Tom. So, but, you really? That's yes. right. Um, so Jared was my office mate and he knew everything down to like the, the, the smallest detail he knew he had it up here in his head. And so he was, uh, an invaluable resource in those early days for me. And he wrote these, uh, tomes of information about each character. And when he didn't actually have the actual information, he made it up. So <laughs> there were things like everyone's addresses right. and, everyone's <laughs> birthdays and their, and their, their, their horoscope signs, you know, mm -hmm. it was just amazing. I mean, it's amazing. I, I actually wrote an article about it for a magazine once because it was so impressive to me. And I, it's my prized possession, his, his, uh, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> it wasn't really a Bible. In other words, it was background information on all the characters. So, and most shows exactly. don't have that. We were very lucky to have it, you know, because mostly you just, sometimes you have to rely on the fans to tell you that you're wrong about something. <laughs> oh, and, 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 and they will. And they will, and, yeah. And they will, you know. <laughs> and, and, you know, um, I don't know if your screens show you what fans are writing on the side, but I recommend just talking to me and not reading. Because as okay. you know, our fans are very passionate about everything. And not everything we, we can do for them could be 100% perfect. Right. So... I don't want anyone, you know, <laughs> um, who or what influenced you? I mean, Tom, soap operas influenced you, but Jean and Susan and Charlotte on becoming writers. Charlotte? Um, well, I started out actually, well, I've always watched soaps from the very, very beginning. I've watched soaps. Um, which I which know, ones? Which I, ones? Um, all my children. I was more of an ABC lineup girl. Okay. <laughs> all my children. <laughs> One Life to Live, General Hospital. Um, I started watching Another World when I was on Another World <laughs> because I started out as an actor. I got my MFA from um, New York University in graduate acting. And then when things were kind of slow coming out, I, um, <laughs> I just started to write. Um, I wrote a play and then things kind of spiraled a little bit. Um, I wrote another play and, and um, well, talk about that play. Cause I, you know, I, I thought that that's fascinating. I mean, you were like, right. you know, so, well, I wrote a three hander for um, myself and two of my classmates. It was kind of like a showcase just because, and I did it in a weekend because um, I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do something like that. And, and uh, we wound up producing it ourselves with studio Tish just to try to attract agents or people to, come and see us. And, um, and then I really loved it. And then I started writing, I wrote another play. And then I got invited to be a part of some writers groups um, um, and, and theaters like um, New York Theater Workshop and um, Playwrights Horizons. And I just kept writing, writing and writing. I was hooked. And um, at the same time, I was still acting and I was doing like, you know, I did a, uh, a stint on Loving and then I did like this little uh, recurring nurse Gwen on another world where I met uh, Linda Miles because she asked me to do a reading of one of her plays and she was a soap writer. So I'm like, well, I'm gonna invite her to one of my plays when I do a reading. So um, I'd won a new professional theater award and I invited her and she came. And after that, she called me up one day and she said, I wanna help you. This is like out of the goodness of her heart. I call her my fairy godmother. I wanna help you. Um, have you ever thought about writing for soaps? And I hadn't, but I'm like, but I watch soaps a lot. And she told me about the writer's development program at ABC. And she um, uh, pitched me to, to I think, um, Molly Fowler and Malie Taggart. Mm -hmm. And uh, I sent uh, the script that uh, had won the award. And then I was invited to attend this, um, what was it, Jean? It was like an orientation or something because Jean yeah. actually taught that class. I did, I taught breakdown yeah. writing. Yeah. yeah, she taught the breakdown um, component of it. And um, I got selected to be part of the group. And yeah. I started out on uh, All My Children as a scriptwriter. 
And, and Jean, you also started acting, right? Just like Charlotte? Yeah, well, kind of, yes. I did when I was in <laughs> college and then uh, I did a couple of film things with uh, the film director, John Sayles. And then by that time I realized I, I just felt like I wasn't really gonna work as an actor and I started getting interested in theater administration and I produced a couple of theaters, including New York Theater Workshop and New Dramatist. And then, I don't know, somebody called me, a, actually a friend from, from nursery school, someone I'd known from birth practically, called me and said, I, you work with writers, don't you be interested in coming to ABC to develop new talent for the writing teams of the soap operas. And I said, okay, you know, so <laughs> I did that for a couple of years and then I, and then I, so I was a network. And, and did you create that with Claire Levine? Yes, that was one of the things, Claire and I put that together and it was really wow. fun, you know, and of course, while she's teaching, she and Megan McTavish taught the breakdown writing part of that. And I mean, Megan McTavish is an amazing breakdown writer and, um, so I'm sitting there listening to all this and thinking, oh, I wonder if I could do this. And then uh, the opportunity arose when uh, Linda Gottlieb came on to One Life to Live and I was her network person. I was helping her train a lot of people who had never written for uh, soaps before to write for soaps. And one day she said to me, you know, you might want to think about doing this yourself because you're teaching all these people to do it. And I said, oh, no, I couldn't possibly, you know, for a little while. And then I thought, you know what? Okay, and and she gave me a shot, and it was, it was all. And you were right. hooked, <laughs> hooked from there. Exactly. And Susan, you you started more more directing, and you were a PA at Guiding Light. Is that correct? Yeah, I I was a directing major in college, and then moved to New York to become this theater director, and realized there was no money in theater. <laughs> <laughs> I had to have a real job in order to do the directing. So I said, can we bring these two worlds together? Uh, and soaps was the way to do it so that I could direct. Uh, and the only way that I could get in the door at Guiding Light was to start in the office. And so I worked my way up. It took me five and a half years to finally get a directing shot. Uh, but, wow. I'm, but I'm grateful I wasn't grateful at the time. I was just frustrated and angry and resentful at the time. But <laughs> but I was grateful in hindsight because I really did learn every step of the way. Um, huh. And I can't, th th I, you just can't trade those moments. And that's what yeah. made me such a strong writer because for three years of my life, I was sitting in dry rehearsals, listening to actors complain about scripts. So, <laughs> And, and coming up with fixes, you know, they would say, oh, I hate this. I hate this line. We need to rewrite this whole thing. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, yeah, that takes, that takes care of it. So, so uh, kind of is there something at Guiding Light that um, stands out or something you directed that fans would remember that you remember? Gosh, um, I directed... Dylan and oh my gosh, I'm going to forget the girl's name. Bridget. No, it was oh, dark hair, long dark. Hair. Yeah, their wedding. No, they're, they're first coming together. They're Julie, Julie, Julie. possibly Mallet's brother, uh, sister, Mallet's sister, Jocelyn Seagrave, maybe. I can't even remember. It's been so long ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Dylan, who was with Dylan with long hair, would be with yeah, long brown. Julie. Yeah, would be oh, or maybe um, um, Samantha Marler. It might be. Samantha yeah, that Marler. sounds right. It's Sam, Dylan, and Sam. Yeah, Susie, Susie right. Cote, Susie Cote. And I, um, I directed auditions for the for Beth after uh, when Judy Evans left. No, oh, okay, for Beth Chamberlain. Yes, and for um, Hamp Hampton Speaks, remember Billy Lee? Yeah, yeah. And yep. actually, uh, Vince. Vince Williams. Vince Williams got that part, and he was amazing. Yeah, he totally and, was. And so that I did very little directing on that show because after I directed my first episode, I said, you know, I've been here for five and a half years waiting for you guys to make me something I already am. So I'm going to leave now. And I left and moved to California and started my directing career there for 10 years. 
Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. And Tom, your first gig was as an intern at Another World. Did, yeah. How did that come to be for you? My junior year screenwriting teacher at School of Visual Arts in New York was really good friends with Leah Lehman. Um, yeah. So I had, I, I talked to everybody that I could talk to in film school, like, you know, anybody on soaps, how do I get my foot in the door on soaps? And uh, yeah, he introduced me to Leah and they were looking for a full-time intern. Um, so I had to take a leave of absence from school and I was there for the last uh, seven months it was on the air. And uh, like I said before, I was going to go back to school afterwards um, and finish up my last year, but then they got the job as the role turns and uh Yeah. And you uh, became a writer's assistant first at World yeah. Turn. Yeah, and I, I echo what Susan said, like working in production, it was so important. Like I, to know how each like piece of the of the puzzle fits together, really mm -hmm. a writer. Um, so yeah, I was a writer's assistant for two years. Um, and then uh, Hogan came on, uh, which I'm sure we'll get to talking to him, talking about him. Mm -hmm. uh, Hogan, uh, Hogan made me a, uh, a temper, like a, like a, a fill-in breakdown writer. So when someone was on vacation, I would write, you know, uh, an episode here and there. Uh, and that ultimately led to me becoming a writer. Hmm. Well, since you mentioned his name, let, let's talk about Hogan. Fan, fans, you mm -hmm. know, definitely um, asking about Hogan. Mm -hmm. Is it, uh, how, how would you describe Hogan as a writer? <laughs> <laughs> as, a writer, as, well, as a writer, the most uh, big-hearted, uh, generous, humanistic, um, hilarious, um, inventive person I can think of, honestly. Uh, he had an, an incredible imagination, and so she was, he was just a born storyteller. And for those who don't know, we lost him in the last year. And uh, it was a great loss. He was a very, um, he was, I mean, he was, it was kind of crazy working for him a lot of the time. You really didn't know where things were gonna go, but they always, <laughs> they always worked out well. So it was a lot of fun. We all worked for him. Everybody. It's hard not to smile when you talk about Hogan. I know. We all immediately smiled. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, for me, I, I was introduced to Hogan when I was a script writer and I had been there a few years at that point and his these outlines would come in and I'd go they what they're on an island like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you're, kidnapping, you're kidnapping the kid water tower why does everybody keep getting murdered at the mill I mean <laughs> <laughs> You try to, you say, oh my gosh, this is just, <laughs> and you throw this outline across the room and then you, you start thinking about it and you go, yeah, you know what, actually this kind of works. Let me see, <laughs> and this is going to be fun to write. And I had so much fun writing for Hogan because you never knew what to expect. He right. really was out of the box. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. There are two shows that when, you know, when you go to the Emmys, and you'd sit there with your team. And there were two shows that I'd always be jealous of by the way that they, the team seemed to, to be. Um, and that, uh, as the world turns and General Hospital, mm -hmm. because they seem like such a family, such like, wow, we're together, you know, and, and they just seem like so much fun. Mm -hmm. And and going, and Hogan who was already there when I got there and, and uh, going into that room, it was like never going to work. It was like just going to a party or something. I mean, it was, it was it really was. so much fun to go to work. A party um, where you argue room. with a lot of people very loud. <laughs> <but. laughs> yeah, he it was. It, he was just. He was. He was just incredible. He he was an, uh, and Gene said the first word that always came came to my mind, which is generous. He was such a generous soul. He taught me a lot about generosity, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's great. I love hearing that. It, it's interesting because, you know, like when people do talk about world turns, you do hear a lot about Doug and you hear a lot about Hogan. And I feel like it's like, like almost like Hogan was Doug's child, <laughs> you know, like he just, it was like, an, you know, sort of that same creative where they. Martha they used just, to say all the time, Martha used to say that, 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 you know, 
when Hogan was there, uh, we were on the show, like she used to say, I haven't felt this way since Doug passed away. Like mm -hmm. that, that, that kind of energy behind the scenes and the energy backstage was, was palpable. Like it was, mm -hmm. yeah, it was amazing. And, you know, he took a lot of huge risks with storytelling. He did things that, you know, other writers historically on that show wouldn't have done. Cause the show always had a very kind of, I think before Hogan. Grounded. Grounded, sort of realistic, yeah. you know, down on the farm kind of quality. And he just blew that right open. And I'm sure it wasn't popular with all of the fans, but it, it really did enliven the show at a time when I think it, it really needed it. You know, it was in kind of a, a slump position at the time and he just charged things up, you know, and it was very exciting. And I think it was a lot of fun for the actors too, you know, mm -hmm. they got to do things they had never, and Martha, God knows, you know, the character Rose emerged mm -hmm. because Hogan saw something in Martha and he thought, wow, Lily is. <laughs> he, only, he saw you know, Rose. He saw, Lily, he saw yeah, the New there's Jersey. There's a Rose in, in Martha. <laughs> <laughs> he, he saw <laughs> the New Jersey. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it was great. It was so much fun, you know. Do you, um, I want to get to your favorites that you've written, but do you have a favorite that came out of Hogan, each of you? Well, I mean, I, I well, somebody else should talk because I have so many of them. But yeah, <laughs> talk. Favorite, talk about favorite, the, favorite. Like favorite story, you know, favorite thing he created or a new character he, he brought on at that time. I loved what he did with Craig Montgomery, and I know the fans are going to be like upset with me for saying that, but I thought uh, Hogan just channeled this like. I just loved Craig. I loved his version of Craig. I loved what he did with Craig. Anything with Craig, Carly, and Jack, and Hal just made me happy. As a writer, as a fan, it just, it was one of those kind of, uh, uh, he was able to take those characters and over the course of like however many years, uh, keep them all in the same orbit, but keep it interesting and keep it uh, moving and keep it fresh. And, and I never felt like it was treading over like the same territory over and over again. Like, mm -hmm. I love that story. Are we going to talk Anybody about else? the woo-woo steam? Remember the woo-woo steam? The woo-woo steam. <laughs> there, was a, there was a period of time when three of the really main uh, actors, That's what I thought you were, yeah. Yeah, Kelly, we're pregnant. We Kelly, had Emily, oh, yeah. Yeah. Emily and Lily and, yeah. and Rose. Uh, I guess maybe was Rose still around? <laughs> yeah, Emily and, and, and Martha Byrne and um, Maura West um, were all pregnant at the same time. And we were going to lose them kind of at the same time, which is, you know, really hard to write around. It's hard enough to write around one Mora West, you know, when you have three people, you know, um, it was really tricky. So he came up with this completely absurd and hilarious story about them going into the spa and getting older. And, and we called it the woo woo steam because there was steam that was making them get older. And we uh, pretty much laughed through that entire thing. I mean, it, it was, it was a crazy story and I'm sure people in the audience are like all over it right now saying that was the most ridiculous thing, but it, <laughs> it was, it served a, a really important purpose and it created a lot of buzz at the time. It was so much fun. And it was so, well, and, the, so good and, and the ladies were great together. My God, the ladies they were, were so great. They put them in yeah. the, that sauna, breathing the woo woo steam and they were hilarious. So it and was, it was a really <laughs> peak, which I think helps help the story along. Like the fact that we weren't taking it so seriously, you know, exactly. everybody knew it was pregnant. And so it was like, we had fun with it and the actresses yeah. were having fun and yeah. And they got to sit there wrapped in towels and bathrobes, you know, so we could cover them up. So that was really funny. And then we put Rose in a coffin and she was buried alive. And I don't I know. About that. Okay. I forgot that. <laughs> I used to that. love to write for Barbara, crazy Barbara. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> she, she was a lot of fun to write for. And Craig Montgomery, when the two of them would get together and the snark, the snark, the snark, that was always fun to, fun to write. Absolutely. I can imagine. I mean, Colleen's got to be a fun character for all of you to write, really. Absolutely. You know, oh, yeah. but Barbara, Barbara, you know, you know, you know, when they switched her years ago from good to bad, I mean, she, yeah. she, went, she went bad. Yeah, she went with it. She was great. You know, she just totally um, cut loose and went with it. It was always a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, it was great to watch the balancing act too that the writers did with a character like Barbara, where like you know you got to pull her back when she goes too far. It's like you, she can't always go to that that dark dark place. Right. Like she gets just close enough and then you pull her back in, um, and it was a real learning experience. She was still sympathetic. 
yep. you know, you yep. know. <laughs> Yeah, she was. Well, I think it, part of it was to her her longevity there that you 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 knew all all of her good and her bad, so you really did care, you know. For bar, you know, unless she really you know murdered twelve people, there was no way people would end up hating her forever because she did good and then she did bad, right? You know, and she was the mother of other characters that people loved as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, I. It's moments that stick out for me. Was it David's funeral where all the women showed up dressed yep. in black? Yep. And Emily came and. David Stenbeck, right? right. And he stabbed him with the hat pin to make sure he was dead. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Julia. Julia fired a, a gun into the coffin. Yeah. Right. Julia getting impregnated by Jack when she, after she had chained him to the bed. Yeah, that's right. Oh. Gave him Viagra and raped him, basically. I mean, now it sounds absolutely horrendous, but it was, you know, <laughs> oh it, was it was it was it was horrendous so then too, I think. But you know, it was a lot of fun. I just remember but watching Annie Perry's Descend into Madness was such a joy to watch. I loved that character, like when she went bad. I loved her. Like she was so having so much fun. Yes. Yes. A Annie was a great character. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Julia was a great character. Yeah. That was David. Oh. I mean, David. David Stenbeck was fan. I mean, talk about you know bringing somebody on to play James's son. That was a yeah. Added a lot. Yeah. Unfortunately, he was gone when I got there. Yeah. David was. Yeah. Yeah. Do you but have a favorite that, character? I'm sorry. Favorite no, character? What were you no. Oh, what were you going to say? Oh, well, I was going to say the story. I think just as a story um, and the way it was it was structured. Um, I really loved the murder mystery of Rose. I mean, oh, yeah. I think back about that. And I, I really think that was a pretty damn good murder mystery. And it, it had all the elements and it. it had the obvious person you thought it was, and then it flipped and it became the kid, you know, it was, it was. And it made total sense. sense. It yeah. all made logical sense in the end. It, there was it, no made, it made a lot of sense because sometimes I might experience. Remind me, who was who? Who killed it Rose? It was Will. It was Will. Barbara's son who oh, accidentally yeah. he 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 resented Rose because he thought she was taking her his Paul away from him, but he didn't mean to kill her. He thought he would just stop the wedding by getting her sick, and it was it was really poignant and um and. And uh, that act, the young actor was amazing, and we all know his name, but I can't. Oh remember. God, I remember those scenes with Benji and and Colleen where they're yeah, they're, where they're not there I know. I'm trying to think of who that right. who that Will was. Um, <sighs> it had read, it was the guy who who ended up playing him, I think. Right, he was, or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they didn't, they hadn't grown him up yet, you know. But um, yeah, just, then it Hendrickson. wasn't Jesse Lee, was it? I don't think it was Jesse, Jesse Lee. Jesse something. Yeah, he came yeah, back. I don't he think it was Jesse. Back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it was whoever yeah. the kid was before that, and he was very good. But what one thing that I really remember, and I used this, I, I kept this videotape. I still own it someplace. But how we found out that there we we were we thought we were going to be preempted on a certain day, and we and it turned out we weren't. So there was a there was an extra day in our writing that we couldn't really. We, for whatever reason, we couldn't back up and, you know, make that, like if we had already written a Wednesday, we couldn't just make it a Tuesday for whatever reason. So Hogan decided to write an episode that was not connected in terms of, it was a standalone episode. It wasn't connected to the day before or the day after, but it was, um, it was just reviewing all of the suspects in the murder. And he did it from the point of view of the dead Rose. I don't know if you guys remember this, but mm -hmm. In the beginning, oh, it's, you see Rose's, Rose's cosmetics in the air because she's dead, but she's fantasizing what her life was. And she narrates the whole thing and kind of takes you on a little glimpse of each character who might have killed her and goes into why that was possible. And it was just completely brilliant. I mean, it was one of the best episodes of, of television I've ever seen. And it, it just fit right in. And it was just a complete accident. You know, it was one of those great... Thing. Well, see, that's what's so amazing about soaps too is something like that just becoming an accident or a scene which many of you must have written because a show was short and you right. had to add a scene for an episode and it becomes one of the you know like a favorite of you know everybody um yeah. i just looked it was brett groneman i i know which oh, one yeah yeah 
That's right. He yeah. was great. He was great. Uh, he was yeah. great. He was really great. And, yeah, and Hal had figured it out early on, and he was going to try to. He had to arrest him, but he didn't want to. And Barbara was trying to take him away in a plane, and it, oh, it was heartbreak. Really good. Very heartbreaking. So the family stuff is what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, like that history of, you know, world turns. I mean, we grew up with Will. We grew up with Pal and Barb, you know, like, so to see them going through all that, everybody's caring about yeah, that. Exactly. Yeah. And that was, so how, sorry, go ahead. How hard was it, you know, ending a 56 year old show? Oh. You know, I mean, it, it's got to be so daunting. Well, like, yeah, know, I mean. 54 you know, when it ended, 54. It was, it was heartbreaking. And, um, you know, we did everything we could think of to try to keep it going. But I, I think at that time, CBS had just had enough. They didn't want to be in the, in the, as the world turns business anymore, as they used to say. And uh, I'm sure there are people writing into you right now. Oh, she killed the soap. Jean killed the soap. But, um, <laughs> Cause I read Twitter. I know. Um, yeah. and, uh, you know, I, it was very, very, very painful. And we tried to kind of pull story together and create, you know, some some nice, like Carly and Jack's uh, wedding for the 10th time or however many times yeah, it was. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, we wanted to have some kind of dramatic uh, event that pulled everyone together. And, and uh, unfortunately, um, Helen died right near the end of yeah. That and we were that was really heartbreaking um, for her sake, but um, also to have her missing on the at the end, you know, when she was right. she put the first line on the show and we wanted her to speak the last, and uh, mm -hmm. so that was that was very hard. Were there things you wanted to do for the end that you know? the powers that be wouldn't let you or, you know, or <laughs> Yes. Is it safe now? Can I save, you know, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. wanted to bring everyone back. We wanted to bring everyone who was still alive, you know, and have that be part of the show. And, and uh, we were able to bring uh, Julianne Julie. more yeah. back, but we wanted her to do, you know, <laughs> I was told, Oh yeah. Right. Or brighter as Franny and, What's the other character? Uh, Sabrina. 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 Yeah. Write both. Write two days worth. And I wrote two days worth. And then they said, "Oh, you know, she's going to come in for one scene." So that was <laughs> that was kind of disappointing. But how how amazing was that? Then I mean, to get it was somebody who totally was amazing. It's and she's always spoken very highly and very um, very complimentarily about her time on the soap and how much she learned and how how hardworking and intelligent everybody was and, and what a great time it was. And so she, it was great that she actually, you know, came in and did that. I mean, we were, we were thrilled. That was a very, it was very nice of her to, to make time for that. We were thrilled, but you know, we would have done it with everybody. We could think, I mean, if we had all the money in the world, which at that point, obviously we didn't, we were going off the air and uh, right. you know, it's not always easy to, arrange that and uh, so that would have made me much happier we've been able to do much more of that but uh, much more family you know much more family yeah more people coming I mean we would have brought you know Penny back or you know people from the early early days of the show um, but that was not in the cards yeah exactly so you, you've all written at so many different shows are there um, stories and characters you're most proud of, something you're most proud of? I mean, e each one of you, I mean, you've spent so much time in these, you know, these worlds. I can think Susan. of, I can Charlotte, think of an ahead. episode yeah. that, that Susan wrote, uh, a breakdown that Susan wrote that I thought was very affecting. It was after Jessica got raped. Um, and- Tamara uh, Tooney. Yes. And she was sitting in her living room on the floor, trying to go over each step that she took that might have caused it, which we know was not the case. But that was so affecting. That's with me to this day. I got chills even thinking about it. But I, I thought that was that was a beautiful episode and, and very telling. And 
And I, that's the first thing that popped in my head. Yeah, that was brilliant. I remember that really well. That was, that yeah. was really good. That was very strong. Yeah, yeah. Do you all read the breakdowns that everybody does? Yes. When yeah. You're, you all do. <laughs> we, yeah. We have to see a them. lot of reading. <laughs> Yeah. As much reading as writing. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have to write. I had I had to read yeah. the World Turns and Guiding Light, and that was 10. So that I can't That's imagine that. writing on top of that. Oh, but, I remember um, my first day at ABC seeing this, you know, my desk had piles and piles and piles of stuff. And I said, what is all this stuff? And they said, oh, it's the breakdowns from loving as the world turns one life to, I mean, loving, you know, all my children at, um, one life at general in general and I, I i thought i oh my god i have to read all of those and um and i never caught up i mean no, it was just impossible but it was just insane so yeah wow. there's a lot of reading involved <laughs> and when, when you when heavy. you're first trying to learn a show oh, that's god. what you're doing too you're doing a whole lot of reading if you can reading. get the writer's assistance to send you as many scripts and things like that before you start actually writing, that's a way to learn the show is just to read, read, read as much as you can. Because I didn't know the show when I first came on. Oh, I remember the welcome packet for, for As the World Turns was a box, like a huge box we would send new writers. And it was like the binder of stuff like that. It was unreal. Yeah, you can't get that now. <laughs> you have to print it all out yourself. <laughs> Overwhelming. Overwhelming. Yes. Right. Yeah. Tom, do you have some uh, something that stands out? that you're most proud of? Brian's death. I I, I really, uh, yeah, those episodes I thought were just, uh, the way everything kind of kept like merging and converging at the hospital and he, how Hogan masterfully took like five different storylines and it intersected them uh, in these really emotional, powerful episodes. I thought all the actors stepped up. I thought it was just, you know, people can debate whether or not it was a good idea to kill Brian. Um, you know, but the fact that like those episodes were just to this day, I still like get like you said, get chills like thinking about it. I just yeah. Tom and I actually talked on the phone while we were both writing that week, and we had all been so excited when Hogan said that he was going to kill him and say, "Oh yeah, we're going." <laughs> <laughs> and, and and Tom and I, I can't believe it. I'm sitting here and I'm crying so hard because Brian, we can't do this. <laughs> yeah, there was yeah. somebody in that room. It's that when you, was you know, crowd. family. Yeah, right. Their family. It, and yeah. it, it hits you when you. I'm sure when you're writing. When I would read a breakdown, I'd cry. Huh? Not a, not even a script with dialogue. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. You would read a breakdown and cry. You know. And that was right around, I, I want to say it was like, we wrote that like a week before 9-11 or a week after 9-11. It was right around 9-11. Yeah. So like oh, kind wow. of the grieving process of losing Bryant at the same time this was happening in real life was, I think it added uh, a subtext to uh, the storyline that, that, that helped. It's a weird thing to say. I don't mean the way it sounds. No, but. it did. It did. And also, I remember there was a, Bryant was in a car and he had a cell phone and he mm -hmm. was calling to basically, it was going to be the last phone call, they, a message that Craig would have and Barbara would have. And he, they would have this, this relic of him. And of course, during 9-11, the all the terrible, you know, the cell, I mean, the cell phone calls that people save, the messages and everything. And yeah. I think we had to change, didn't we change the script? We cut it, yeah. We thought it was going to be too painful for people wow. and too reminiscent of what was going on. So, yeah, it definitely did. It was a sad time. It was very tough. Wow. Ooh, so I have I a crazy that. moment that I'm actually proud of us for doing. <laughs> <laughs> I like okay. it. Go. All right, so we had um, to do product placement every now and then. <laughs> That's and my I don't know fault. If you call that was one, thanks fault. one Thanksgiving. That's my fault. That's guys, I brought it to you. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. What'd you say? I brought those things to to you guys to have to put in the show a lot of times. <laughs> right. You know, one of them was butterball turkey. Oh my god. Oh my god. I, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Do you guys remember this? Yes. Speaking of crazy Julia, crazy, crazy Julia, Julia yeah. was stealing, was come had come back to steal uh, Jack's baby, Jack and Carly's baby, and I don't know how we did it, but we 
uh, we were trying to figure out how to work butterball turkey into it. And we were talking about Julia leaving, trying to run away. But then uh, at the last minute, she throws the baby. And and <laughs> like, what yeah. if it was a butterball turkey? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Wrapped up in swaddling like a baby. <laughs> We were so thrilled with ourselves oh, after we went for a coffee break. Remember, we were like high fiving we each other. We were exhausted <laughs> from laughing. I too love much, that. But it was great. That was one of the best products. Yeah. Ever. yeah. That was good. Proud moment. Proud moment. <laughs> Sadly, we needed those to pay for things, unfortunately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So make it fun, right? <laughs> yeah. Oh, I do I, want I, to I, mention I, something because it hasn't come up, but the, the Luke and Noah love story was um, very probably one of my favorite things that we ever did on that show. And it was, it was interesting because I'd been on one life to live when we wrote the Billy Douglas story, which also had been very well received and important. I thought, but the problem with that. Gene, I just had Chris McKenna on a couple of weeks ago. Oh, yeah. We were talking and we were talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. He was so young at that time. He when was. That story happened. Yeah. And you know, the I, truth is, Michael Malone wanted Chris McKenna, the character of um, Joey, to be the one who was gay. But because he was the, you know, Vicky and Vicky and Clint's son, you know, it would, would have been much more uh, significant if it if the son who was gay turned out to be the son in the in the main family. But the we weren't allowed to do that. We were they didn't want that because they you know, they were, I don't know, I guess they were nervous about Joey growing up with the show and being gay, you know, but, um, but well, then, luckily you were allowed to do it at World Turns. We were allowed to do it at World Turns because it was Holden and Lily's son, you know, and it, it was, um, it was a great opportunity, I thought, and a, and a, and a, you know, a story that was really fun to tell. I mean, it kind of got choked, I think, at the end, but it started out really well until, mm-hmm the powers that be on some level freaked out a little bit about what we'd done, I think. I really loved what you guys did with Holden too in that story. I thought what you did with him was was real unexpected and very moving. Oh, good, thanks. Oh, I totally agree because it's not the norm, Tom. Right. As, as two gay men, it's not the norm. Right, you switched who would yeah. have the the issue with, with their child being gay. And that that definitely was, I think, a huge positive step for people to see at home. That's good. Yeah, I think so too. And the fact that we could have them kiss and be physical to even to a small degree, I think was felt like a move in the right direction. The other thing that I liked about that was it was not played heavily, but Emma, the grandmother was, we played that we realized after we'd been writing it for a little while that nobody had told Emma that, that Luke and Noah were a couple. And so we decided to make something of that. And we said, we decided that no one had told her um, because they were worried that she would react badly because she was the grandmother and she was old fashioned or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I, I really, I don't remember whose idea it was. I'm fairly certain it wasn't mine, but um, because I still sit back in awe of what a great idea it was. She was deeply wounded that no one trusted her enough to tell her. So she wasn't remotely upset about the fact that her grandson was gay. What she was upset was that the family didn't see her as a, a person who could, would love her grandson no matter what and could digest the news like a grown up, you know? And I really loved that. I thought that was very cool, so. Lucinda's reaction was great too. I, mean, I can't place it completely, but I, I, I remember the scene and, and she, she talked about it when I had her too, but, um, you know, I mean, what's it like writing for someone like Liz? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I had a moment um, because uh, Elizabeth Hubbard was famous for changing lines. Mm-hmm. And I was home for Christmas and I was watching the air show. And I turned to my mother and I said, Elizabeth Hubbard just gave me a Christmas present. She actually said everything I wrote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and and I never I never was insulted by that because she had certainly been Lucinda a lot longer than I had written Lucinda. So follow your instincts, Liz. It's fine with me. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Liz that Hubbard and Mark Lockwood a scene together. As a writer, you just go, "Well, I have no idea what they're going to say, but we'll just exactly. <laughs> exactly. 
compare those. <laughs> well, it, it, must be, it must be something to the watch, though, even if it's not word for word, just to see them take what you've, you know, created, because you do create that moment where that, you know, the, the storyline, and then boom, watching someone like Liz and Hunt and, Car you know, Mora and Michael just make magic. It must be something for you as writers to see that. Yeah, my, my favorite episode definitely has to be Carly and Jack breaking up the marriage when oh, he God. left the house. Um, yes, you, you wrote that, didn't you? I wrote, I wrote the script, yeah. but yeah. I can't take credit for it because the breakdown, the layout was wonderful, the breakdown was wonderful, the editing was wonderful, the producing was wonderful, the actors, of course, were exquisite. So everybody showed up. And it is such a beautiful episode and such a, um, a monument to everything they built as mm -hmm. actors and characters for all those years and all the investment that we had in them as an audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty, pretty spectacular. I remember her at the front door, you know. That yes. Oh, yeah. And okay. Grant Alexander directed that episode. Oh, really? Wow. Oh, wow. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And um, well, you know, there were some fans asking, you know, when something um, like Benjamin passing away during, um, you know, it, you know, somebody who's so beloved as a, not only an actor but a character, you know, and, and finding a way to, um, you know, honor the character. How difficult is that? And you may not have necessarily been there, but I'm sure at other shows certain things happen and. You know, um, if you were there, if there's anything you can say on that. Well, with, with Benjamin, that was just, we were all devastated. I mean, everybody was completely devastated. And, I, I, it, you know, he was such a lovely man. And the, and the, and the care, and everyone loved him. And the, the character of Hal was kind of salt of the earth, you know, he's so central to the, to the story and to the, the families. And, Every story somehow I remember thinking kind of revolved around Hal somehow, you know, yeah. he had some connection. And so we we had to justify his absence and we wanted to allow people to grieve on, you know, so we created an incident that happened off camera, I think, that, you know, it was the only way we could do it, that he had been out of town and had stepped stepped into um, save someone's life in a, he, you know, she just happened to be there was a crime was being committed and he was shot and killed in the process of it. And, um, so it was unsatisfying because we didn't have him, of course, and we were all mm -hmm. grieving. Um, and I know the audience was grieving, but we, we tried to honor him by, you know, celebrating the heroism of the character. And, uh, but yeah, you, you know, you, you have to find a way. But that, that is a great way. I mean, heroism, you know, is what you would think for Hal Munson. But, and, and also like a, a character, you know, you said he is, he's connected to everyone, which, which yeah. just, that's the sign of an, you know, just all of you coming together as writers, not, you know, whether it's this group in front of me, but people along the way, just, you know, Hal and Barbara, Hal and Margo, Hal and Carly. Carly, yeah. Parker, <laughs> you know, he's gonna, yeah, yeah. yeah, you know, he, he's just got that, his, his, you know, tent, you know, they're all over. He, he, he was connected to everybody. Are there things that you um, fought really hard for um, and you didn't win? You know, a character, um, a story that you wanted to tell, but, you know, for whatever reason, it didn't play out? Hmm. Well, I will say just in general um, that I always, what I loved, loved, loved about writing for As the World Turns was the generations, that there were still, to a certain degree, intact families and generations. And I agree that, I think you said this, Alan, that that's what soap opera is all about, the families and the interactions among the generations. And I, if I'd been able to do anything, as sort of what I was saying about the end of the show, I would have been able to use the, the entire canvas more, but there are money considerations, you know, would have happily 
brought in people, played all of the, you know, the as much of the uh, original or early cast as we could all the time and play them in integral roles in the story. But I'm not, you know, I don't mean to cast blame here, but there was, you know. It, I, it's not blame, but it is something I think fans don't, you know, I didn't, I didn't understand. Right. I didn't understand as a fan, you know, like I said, I grew up, my mother watched, learned to speak English watching. I grew up watching World Turns and Guiding Light, you know, couldn't understand when I didn't see Bob and Kim myself right. or, you know, whoever on Guiding Light. But right. it is, you know, it, you know, sadly, it is money that generates or, or puts these on the air. And, right. and sadly, money plays a part in how often an actor can be used or not used. Yes. And, and you know, I know that might take some of the magic away, but it is just it's sadly a, the truth of. Yes, very you know, hard that, reality. It's a very hard time reality. too. It's, it is everywhere. It's not yeah. just day time. Yeah, um, and it also, I think um, it's money, but it was also, I think I, this, this I experienced when I started in soaps that there was this idea that only young people will bring young people to the soaps. And I have always disagreed with that from the very beginning, because I know as myself as a viewer, when I was younger, I like to see, oh God, how's you know Phoebe gonna react to the marriage of Chuck and Tara on, you know, I mean, I go way back, I'm ancient, but you know, that you wanna know, I mean, that's, really part of the the joy of it you want to see the age spread and you're not just you know you, you don't have to have 15 year olds on the show to bring in young people they're interested in carly and jack and barbara and hal and craig and rosanna you know I, I completely agree that it's, it's mr mark i mean i you know truly bob and kim as as i grew up for me i was you know a teenager they were my you know parents mm -hmm. but they were like one of my favorite characters I, yes. you know yeah that they brought me their family brought me them you know right. they they were still you know that that wasn't the young kids that were bringing me to watch right it exactly was, yeah yeah and i loved it's, them and i loved their acting and i loved everything they could do and and you know and lisa and you know lucinda and everybody else and you know you were asking about when we had lucinda when she found out um, Luke was gay. Her husband started coming on to. Remember, she was married to Brian. Oh, right. Her husband started coming on to Luke, and oh, right. he didn't know um, how to tell. Luke didn't know how to tell Lucinda that her husband was coming on to him. Yeah. And I loved that story. I just thought <laughs> that could just explode in a thousand different directions, but it was cut short. You know, it was who just was like, the actor who played him? Um, he was he was well known and he was fabulous. I think his name was Brian something, or was the character Brian? I don't know, but he was great. Oh shoot, I I can't think of I, I somebody. Larry Lau was yeah. it? Yeah, was it Larry Lau? Was it Larry Lau who played him? It could be. Could I be. Know, could be, it could be. He was great, and he, and oh my God, I just loved the possibility of that story. But it just got, you know, like cut, not by my desire, but um, right. that happened a lot, you know, because for whatever reason, I don't know. But is there yeah. a character any of you on any soap dreaded writing for? <laughs> <laughs> You think for whatever reason, there? you don't have to. You don't have to say why. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend no one's listening. Go. You don't have to. <laughs> Gotta go. <laughs> All right. Let, I'm, do you have a show that you found, or, or you know, a story that you found hard to write for, for uh, your your own personal connection, or you know, whatever the reason? Yeah, my for me, it was Craig deciding that he was going to force Meg to miscarry Oof. the baby by giving her this concoction. Ugh. And I, I have never, I don't think I've ever met Scott Bryce, but <laughs> it was so hard for me to write that and to save Craig and to him fighting the entire time knowing this was the wrong thing to do because I couldn't get out of it. I mean, he had to do it. And, yeah. and 
when I watched it, it really did feel like the writer and actor doing the dance. We were doing the same dance together. Mm -hmm. I felt completely compatico with him that he he simpatico with him that he had gotten where I was trying to lead him and he took it everywhere it needed to go to preserve Craig as a sympathetic character. Wow. Yeah, that was mm -hmm. a really that was the hardest episode I ever had to play. Anybody else? I, I think more recently actually, um just the, talking about crying when you when you read breakdowns and things is Oscar's death on General Hospital, writing uh, him struggling through um, his cancer and then coming into grips with the fact that he's dying and then it all playing out and then he, then the then him dying and it, it was just heartbreaking. <laughs> it was really emotional to. Um, to, to write and watch and, and and that was you know I being the mother of teens <laughs> it's just hard you know yeah. thinking about something like that so that was really tough and Charlotte you're back at work right writing for General Hospital now uh, we haven't started writing yet but they're back in production oh okay. we wrote we wrote like a full month after everybody stopped writing so they've got scripts. <laughs> or, or they, you know, they've they've got stuff. But well, thankfully, I, you know, thankfully, looking everybody. Looking forward any minute. <laughs> yep. Thankfully, they are back and and being smart and doing all of that. Uh, yes. Is yes. the is the virus going to be a factor? Is I, I I know you can't tell me, but I'm just curious. Is are they going to play that? You know, there's a pandemic going on <laughs> in Port is Charles. Is anybody doing that? I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, I'm just asking. I, I have no idea. I'd be shocked know. if if nobody does it because yeah. I mean it's Somebody's such an important somebody has I mean it's not you know if it was going away but it's not going yeah. away. <laughs> I think it's safe to say they can keep writing it because it's not going to disappear in the <laughs> three weeks it, or whatever it, before it's not. It yeah. 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 Crazy. Yeah. And Jean, talk about and and I think Charlotte, you said too, Agnes. You know what what it was like working uh, with Agnes Nixon. Well, she she was speaking of generous souls. She was very lovely to me from the minute I met her, uh, which was my first day at work. I, I had lunch with Agnes Nixon my first day at, as a network person at, at ABC, and that was kind of a good way to start. Um, and we enjoyed each other immensely. She was she she was. I mean, we see her as this beautiful, very dignified lady, and you know the sort of the doyen of soaps, but as some of you probably know she could, you know, like gossip with the best of them and have this shrieking laughter when she thought something was funny. And, you know, so we got along fine, the two of us, but she, she taught me so much about um, just following the heart of the character, you know, and, and she also, interestingly, this is, you know, my way of working, the way I'd been taught was that you kind of think ahead in a big way and you plan each week and each month and you kind of know, you know, at least to some degree, you kind of know what the, we, we were forced, forced, sorry, we were asked to write um, <laughs> uh, story documents, which I, I never liked doing because I always thought we're going to come up with something better than this in the room. You know, like we can write this thing with all the plot developments, but it's going to get thrown away and we're going to come up with something better, you know. Mm -hmm. And Agnes felt that way too, which was really interesting. She never really wrote long-term story. She kind of knew, she knew where she was going. She knew what the end was. And she had some idea of some of the twists and turns, but she would never, you know, write those big volumes that we were asked to write. She would write, you know, a couple pages that would say, okay, this is basically what we're going to do. And because she was Agnes Nixon, of course, they trusted her that she was going to do that, you know, and even within a breakdown, you know, you're writing the, the, ep the episode, one episode at a time, and you write an outline of it basically. And um, she didn't necessarily know what act two was, you know? I mean, it was very interesting. It was always kind of one act at a time and it always came out of what had just happened. And it always came out of character and not plot. And uh, so she was, I feel very, very lucky that I got a chance to, to know her, to work with her. It was a great opportunity. That's yeah. great. And you, you mentioned something that I'm curious about now. Um, is there something you remember? Because I'm sure, um, like you said, Jean, about 
not having it all down on paper, like being creative and being in the room. Mm. And somebody just tosses something, almost like Charlotte said with the butterball, but is there <laughs> something that, that isn't product <laughs> placement that. that, you know, that you were just sitting around that you remember, like, and because and, when you are in a room, are, are there ideas flowing like that where somebody's tossing things out? Oh yeah, yeah. That's the most fun thing about it, you know. Yeah. Really is. I mean, well, maybe it's Susan. I'm trying to think it was you, but I can't remember what it was. It was some. Anyway, I think, you know, every now and then somebody will say something like, "Well, what if, what if he's gay, or what if, you know, mm -hmm. what if?" I can't remember what any. You know, I'm sure that if I, you gave me half an hour, yeah. I'd come up with those moments. But they all. It's always those great things where we all go, oh my God, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. And then the whole thing. The, the light bulb goes and everybody gets all tingly. <laughs> yeah. and well, you know, I remember, sure. one, I remember one thing like that that was an accident on One Life to Live, which was that Michael Malone had just started and he named um, a character uh, Manning. Oh. And he didn't know, oh, Todd Manning. It was Todd Manning. And he did not know or had forgotten that Manning was Tina's last name. Her mother's name was Irene Manning. And she had been Victor Lord's mistress, you know. And somebody said, wow, well, what if, what if Todd is, why is, what if he's a Manning because he's related to Irene Manning? What if he's Irene Manning's son? And then like five years of <laughs> 10 years of story came out of that, you know. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's great. Oh, that was huh. exciting. Yeah. Um, were, were any of you there at World Turns uh, when Emily became a prostitute? Because one of our fans is dying to, to know oh, what God. you remember about Emily becoming a prostitute. Kelly. Uh, I will just say it was my idea. It was not my <laughs> idea. <laughs> So, uh, yes, I was there. It was unfortunate. Okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Not, not, not for Kelly. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tom, talk about what you're doing now. Writing. I don't even uh, fully understand. You're writing for Apex Legends. 75 uh, million people play this game around the world. Yeah. It's, um, I kind of stumbled into this and it's, it's really a joy. Um, I am, uh, one of three writers on a live service video game uh, where it's a, it's a battle royale game, much like Fortnite, but there's, so there are storylines that are taking place behind the scenes, basically. And so I basically create the characters and write the dialogue for this ongoing serialized uh, uh, video game with, there's like 18 characters right now. We introduce a new character every three months and there's uh there's all sorts of stuff going on there's there's gonna be a love triangle pretty soon there's gonna be yeah it's it's uh it's very similar to soaps but it's it's cool because you get to kind of tell soaps where the player decides what's gonna happen which is very so i'm so not a gamer so i don't really get it so people you're there's a story sort of around the game yep and we do animated shorts and uh and uh we, we've released three animated shorts and uh uh, there's other stuff coming out that I can't talk about yet, but um, we're trying to like hit as many different uh, formats for the IP as possible. So it's it's been such an adventure and so exciting to kind of be a part of it. We launched the game a year and a half ago, and like day one, we had like 10 million people sign up for it, and it's just been like it's it's wow. been such an adventure and such a joy to like create these characters and take them on this journey. And I I, I love my co-writers. I adore them. Like it's just it's really wild. It's been amazing. Sounds like um, fun. Were you a gamer before that? I was um, not hardcore, um, but uh, they've kind of given us, you know, when we started, it was like, well, we'll just write like some fun character driven dialogue. And, and it's really kind of uh, uh, blown up. Like now we have a whole new system in the game where like characters will say different things from characters depending on who they are. And they're, you know, it's very specific dialogue now, which is great. Um, you know, originally it was just, they would say the same thing to all 18 characters, but now we can kind of mix that up and, and we can have characters, uh, grow and evolve and progress. Like if two characters get in a fight, they can be mad at each other for the next two months, and then they can make up and then they're best friends <laughs> for the next two months. And, uh, 
Um, very, very soap like. <laughs> very soap like. Um, so it's been really, it's just been so much fun, kind yeah. of building this world, and it's you know it's all it takes place in the year twenty seven thirty three. So it's it's the future, um, and so kind of creating this world and creating the politics and the religions and the and the 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 the, the structure of this galaxy has been just really awesome. Wow, that's wild. And, and Susan, you. You left uh, when World Turns went off the air. Young and the Restless hired you, and you were the first black writer to join their team in 37 years. 47 years, yeah, yeah. 47. That is, I, I was shocked that I read that. That, that I they was had not too because I, I, say, there were four black writers on World Turns when I was there. So. Yeah. It it blew my mind that in all that time there had not been another black writer. And I'm actually this just in this happened yesterday. I'm going to be returning to YNR as a story. Uh oh, oh great! That's September. Fantastic. Good. Cool. So you'll have two yeah. on YNR now. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And Lynn Martin. Lynn, Lynn Martin. She was on. Uh, yeah. So really. But, but I mean, what's so interesting is they. They had so many black characters, but they didn't have I a single know. black writer. I, that, I'm just surprised, to be completely honest. I was when I read that, I was really, you know, surprised. I'm surprised just hearing it <laughs> <laughs> right now. I've been the first black person in many rooms over the course of my career, mm -hmm. and looking back on it, I I, I liken it to being the new kid on the block and you're putting together a basketball team and you're going to pick the person you know first. And then you're going to pick the person who looks like the people you know. And so you don't even consider the people who don't look like you or yet you don't know. It's not that you're being exclusionary, but you really just don't even consider it. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, as we're going forward, I'm glad that um, more companies are putting themselves in a situation where they are giving people from all backgrounds to consider. Right. right. And then we have more of a jumping off place as opposed right. to having to run in there and knock down doors. Yes. Right. It shouldn't just be, you know, the fact that I had to say that you were the first black writer, I mean, it should have just been a writer's room. Like you said, World Turns had four writers. Yes, it's right. a writer's room with That's diversity. Right. That's, That's right. you know. But I don't um, remember World Turns there being a push, like we have to find more black writers. No. Yeah. No. It was just always that way. It just happened yeah. that way, yeah. yeah. Yep. Crazy. Oh, um, and you, talk about the book you wrote. How did that come about? How did, how did you get that job, my dream jobs, and how they came true? Well, the book is available on Amazon. I would say to people, you know, they'd ask me, what do you do? And I'd say, I'm a soap writer. And they'd say, how did you get that job? And it was always <laughs> in that, it was always in that tone of voice. And you're just, <laughs> okay, I do have a bachelor's degree from Carnegie Mellon University. Can we just, <laughs> and, and so I decided to write about it. And, and, and how, when you're starting from, scratch how you get in, how you get in the door and how you stay in the door. And um, Jean commented on a, a post that I put on Facebook about my mom and and how I'm connected to Godzilla because mom said, you know, they must call you Godzilla. And I'd say, what? what? <laughs> so, yeah, when I was working on Guiding Light and, and I was the only black person there for quite a while. And she said, because they knock you down and knock you down. And every time they turn around, here you come again. <laughs> you keep coming back. You keep coming back because your dream has got to be bigger than their nose. You know, you've just got to keep seeing the dream is beyond the person in front of you who is telling you no. Hmm. And, and that has gotten me very, very far indeed. And I couldn't be more grateful for my career. That's awesome. We did have a fan who, who asked what steps uh, an older professional can take to break into a writer's room. Um, they graduated with their BS at age 50 um, and were curious 
Anybody uh, thoughts, ideas on or the best piece of advice? Well, um, a lot of times new writers come up as assistants. And so that's hard for somebody who, you know, might have a family to support, um, but it's not impossible. And I think um, probably, you know, sending a writing sample, getting the name of the head writer and the producer and emphatically stating you know, interest in um, doing whatever it takes to learn the show and learn how to be part of the team and then being persistent. Other than that, honestly, I don't know, doing homework. A lot of times people would send in, uh, I think there may be rules about sending in writing samples actually, yeah. but I think you gotta get a name. You gotta get a name of somebody on the team that you're directly sending something to or start with an in inquiry, you know, don't, uh, just send a, a work and, and just don't give up. I mean, like Susan said, you know, that the dream's got to be um, stronger than the no, you know, it's very, it's very difficult. There's a, there are only three shows now, right? So. Um, four. Four, but sorry. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look yeah. at, I mean, Tom grew up knowing he wanted to be a writer. Right. And he yeah. did it, you know, right. he knew. It is possible for sure. It is. Yeah, I would also say that it, somebody in their mid forties who, uh, kind of started over in a new genre. There's this mentality, I feel like, when you're older to think that you know more, you have more life experience, you you know, you know, you know better than the 25, 30 year olds. And I would suggest you not take that approach. I listen, that. <laughs> listen, you never know what you can learn from people. And I have learned so much from the 32 year olds that I work with and the 27 year olds that I work with. Um about and, and they might be your boss. Yeah, and, yeah, we yeah. are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I don't assume that because you're older, you know better. That's not yeah. all. The case. Yeah. However, I would say that I mean, there's so many different platforms and things now that people can get exposure um, uh, on, and uh, it doesn't have to be an established writing room. You can That's do true. things on your own that get you noticed, and um, things that I'm not doing. But I should probably, <laughs> if, you know, if, if it ever came down to it. But I also want to say this thing too about writers who are more mature, is that I do appreciate the wisdom that comes through uh, with a writer that that is a little more mature because sometimes I find the I find the writing a little more nuanced um, and and in and more having more depth. Um, or just life experience, humor, things like that. So don't be daunted by it. Don't, don't be ashamed of it. Um, you know, it's a strength that, that you can bring to the table. I'm talking to my square. I should be talking to the camera. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> but it's a strength that, that you can bring to the table, and I would be unapologetic about it. Yeah. Yeah, and I agree. I think I think Tom, what you were saying is don't like be condescending about it, sort of. Right. You know? Yeah. yeah exactly. no, no. There's an entry point where you have to learn, you know, yeah. and, and it doesn't matter how old you are. But I yep. agree yeah. with both of you. Well, and, I'm not negating what Tom said. I'm just but, adding my Yeah. Gina, are you enjoying retirement? Uh yes, I am. I'm doing a few little things. Um, aside from um becoming a grandmother, which I'm insanely excited about. Um, <laughs> but I um, I am, I, you know, it hasn't been quite what I, this, these last few months haven't quite been the the, the, the wonderful. You, you might've been doing like something that. else. Yes. If, if um, you locked down. But um, I've been writing, I do, I work so, every now and then, I work for a company called Radish, which is a, a format uh, for phones that basically started in Asia. And it's uh, fiction, but um, a lot of uh, retired soap writers are working on it because we're oddly qualified to do it. We have to basically outline a chapter of, a, of an ongoing um, story. So imagine a novel that is structured like a soap opera and then it has no end. So we're, I'm writing essentially little outlines for, for this. And the company, the, the, the head of the company here in New York is Sue Johnson, who was um, 
mm. worked at the network for a long time and, and uh, you know, was, I think, at ABC. And yeah, I was going to say that name sounds familiar because yeah, I yeah. started a, as a page for ABC. Yes, exactly. And she that, started yeah. out, I think, as Pat Philly's assistant, and then she became the network person on One mm -hmm. Life to Live and All My Children. And she's really, really smart, and she had the, the smart idea of bringing in all these soap operas to outline the, the, the stories. And it's a lot of fun. I mean, it's very quick. You know, you have to be able to, like, come up with plot really, really fast. And um, but it's like Leah Lehman is doing it, and Addie Walsh, and um, and Lisa Connor, and uh, a bunch oh, wow. of people, all, Shelley Alden. All of you, yeah, I love it. we're that's, all doing it. So, and uh, I, I don't do it a lot, but I find it really fun. It's sort of mental exercise to sit down and, and do that. And I also, during this time, I work with a theater company off and on, and I wrote a little tiny, like a three and a half minute film, which is my film debut. Um, which is now okay. in a, it is a, it's a, I'm proud to say it's a runner up in a film festival of short horror films. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Send us the link when, when I will, we can, I will. when we can it's, see it. You know, it, it was done with everybody in isolation. You know, I wrote it and then all the actors put themselves on, uh, you know, film themselves. And then one of the actors put it all together. So. It's kind of a, a horror it's movie. A, it's a crazy new medium. Everybody's Pandemic horror movie. Yes. Everyone's finding a way to do it through this. I, yeah. Um, do, do you all have a guilty pleasure you've been enjoying during quarantine television? <laughs> I've got this crazy one. Ho these homesteading. <laughs> what are these that? homesteading shows? Like, like people who move to the mountains or to the woods and then they have their farms and they, they're off the grid. <laughs> what is that on? Discovery. Okay. That and, and binge it's... watching Frasier in the middle of the night. Oh gosh. <laughs> Comedy's good right now. It's yeah. a good comedy. And yeah. Frasier's else? very funny. <laughs> Tom, do you have a guilty pleasure? I haven't, well, I haven't turned a TV on in like two years, believe it or not. It's so crazy to me, but like, I, I've been so like, just in, in, in the thick of work and building this galaxy and all this stuff that that's pretty much been my life for the last I, I don't know what that actually even means, not to turn a television on for like, I know, I was a, <laughs> I was the biggest television geek ever and I, it's so strange to me, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Well, this, this is pretty geeky, but I, I was t doing pottery. Part of my retirement thing was learning how to make pottery. On oh, wheel, that's awesome. Which is very, you know, I was just beginning to be able to do it without creating an utter chaos out of clay. And when the pandemic hit, but I found on YouTube, there's a show called, this isn't the exact title, but it's close. It's like the Great British Pottery something or other show that I have a friend who's watching that I and believe. it's, it's kind of like the great great British baking, baking. show but it's for yeah. people who make pots so it's completely absurd but a lot of fun I, you know and there are all these wacky British people with great accents and you know it's it's fun not as much fun as the cooking shows but they they, and you, they give you Susan little... oh my goodness it's that girl Jen oh my god <laughs> And Law and Order SVU. Oh, what was the middle? What was the middle one? That girl was Judge the first. Judy. Judge, Judge Judy. Judy. <laughs> this, this, because Judge Judy is is what I do while I'm brushing my teeth at night. Well, you're keeping the checks <laughs> coming for Judy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> she she needs those checks. Um, one of the fans wrote, "Young and the Restless needs you badly." So, con congratulations on that! And seriously, thank you all for doing this. I hope you had fun. I had a blast. Awesome. So, 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 so good and to see you all. We got the you band all. back together. I know. We got the band. Know, stay, <laughs> stay here for a minute. I'm just going to sign off, and then we'll we'll go from there. Okay. But thanks so much for doing this. I thanks. know the fans really appreciated it. Thank you, fans. Thanks. So so much for tuning in t today, everybody. Have a great weekend, and I will see you on Wednesday.